Okay, good Friday morning. Uh, back here, naturalists. My name is Tim. I work at the Urban Ecology Center here in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, in the US of A. And happy 2023 to you and your community. Thank you for being part of my community every Friday morning at 9 a.m., no matter the weather, as we explore the critters, the plants, the life forms, and the processes that make up our backyards, our front yards, our side yards, and, and inside of our houses. Today, we are exploring the world of Caffea, which is the genus of the group of plants, a group of trees that brings coffee to our backyards. And because coffee is the number one beverage on the planet after water, uh, it has a rich history with lots of stories to tell. And there are a lot of people who have told the stories of coffee over the years. Um, so I'll, I'll touch a bit on coffee, the beverage, and I will touch a bit on that history as we do each week. But I will um, mostly concentrate the stories on coffee, the biological organism, um, and we'll get, look at, at its adaptations to living as a plant and how that affects how we enjoy coffee today, as was the case with potatoes and wheat and corn. Uh, one of my goals is to, to give you a few more things to contemplate from a biological perspective, uh, another way to enjoy that coffee um, when you're sipping it. So sit back and relax, maybe with your cup of coffee or, or your cup of tea, or if you prefer, whatever, whatever beverage you enjoy uh, as we look into the stories of coffee in episode 19 of season four of the Backyard Naturalist, Brew Planet, and of course, my utmost appreciation uh, to those to the subscribers of the series for keeping it running, going on almost three, three straight years now. Your support keeps this accessible to everyone. Okay, so uh, two weeks ago in the episode on the potato plant, I mentioned a group of plants called the asterids, uh, which has given rise to a wonderful who's who of popular food plants and ornamental plants and spices and trees. Uh, we also mentioned that in addition to all of those other plants, this is the group of plants that gave us coffee. So we went, you know, a couple of weeks ago, we went down the the nightshade lineage of the asteroids um, that gave us the potatoes, the tomatoes, the eggplants. And this time we're going to go down a different lineage towards coffee, starting with a group of asteroids called the gentianales. And this is an order of plants that includes gentian, uh, oleander, and periwinkle, in addition to coffee. And this is a group that has been intensely studied for its medicinal properties and has led to, to many advancements in understanding treatments of pain and anxieties, uh, cancers, and neurological conditions. From here, the path to coffee takes us to the Rubiaceae family, uh, which is often called the coffee family. This, this could, there's over 13,000 species, uh, 620 genera, so it makes it one of the largest families of flowering plants, the coffee family. Um, they are found worldwide, but most of them are found in the tropics. And in addition to coffee, Rubiaceae brings us quinchona. This is the source of quinine um, used as an antimalarial. Um, and this also gives us some wonderful ornamental plants like gardenias and some plants historically used as dyes like madder, like rose madder. Um, and then from here, we get on this Super highway that leads us to the to the tribe first to the tribe coffee and then the genus coffee and I was I was talking to some colleagues recently and they asked me what genus was coffee plant and I couldn't for the life of me remember um, and as you can see it it is very confusing to remember the genus so I, I guess I can forgive myself for for forgetting in any case the genus coffee coffea. Uh, there's actually more than 120 species, mostly shrubs, and um, of these 120 species, there's just a few species that produce the coffee beans that supports the coffee industry that has dominated the worldwide beverage market for hundreds of years. Uh, I remember sitting in a, in a coffee shop in Mexico City that was you know, older than any building uh, in in this area by far, Hun hundreds of years older than any building we have in, in at least, you know, current building that's still around. Um, so in the most 
popular coffee plants. We harvest the bitter seeds for roasting and adding to hot beverages. But in some parts of the world, still to today, uh, they're, the, the coffee plants are used, their, their fruits are what they use. So for juice, um, they're also, the fruits are very high in caffeine and they're sweeter, just like with chocolate. Uh, the, the seed is bitter, but the fruit is very sweet. Um, and both the beans and the berries are loaded with caffeine for the most part. Um, but it's, it's harder to enjoy the fruits of the berries unless you're near where they grow because uh, they don't transport as well unless you dry them. So the two most popular species of cafea that are used in the coffee industry are seen here. You have cafea arabica, which gives us arabica coffea, and then you have cafea canifora, which gives us the robusta variety of coffee. Depending on the source in the year, arabica accounts for about 70% of the world's coffee production, uh, and robusta about 30%. And since these are the two most dominant coffee plants, at least in terms of the ones that are present in our houses and backyards, uh, we're going to focus mainly on these two, particularly on, on the Arabica. So the most popular coffee plant uh, in the world and for the most popular beverage uh, is coffee, Cafea Arabica. Um, it's, it's likely the... it's likely the first species of coffee that we began to harvest, um, even though it formed from a hybrid of the Robusta variety. So the Robusta is older genetically, uh, but uh, the Arabica is the version that kind of humans really, really uh, had a relationship with. Um, the, it has its origins in an area that includes the highlands of Ethiopia, um, at, along with the Borna Plateau of, Su of Sudan. And just like any good plant, any good organism, it starts off life as this adorable little baby coffee bean uh, that sprouts into the just these cutest little coffee plants that you, you ever did see. Without human intervention, a coffee infant like this will grow into an adult coffee tree uh, up to 40 feet high. But it is a, a sub canopy tree, so it doesn't, it's never going to get to the top of the canopy. It's a, it's a more of an understory tree. Um, but of course, in coffee production, a, a 40 foot tree would be unwieldy. So in, in agriculture, they keep the coffee trees really low to the ground because the beans are still handpicked today. And like a good angiosperm, the, the coffee tree eventually produces flowers. The flowers smell like jasmine, if you ever get a chance to to smell them and then the flower becomes the fruit, starting green, turning yellow and then red. Um, and it, it, it may take a year on average, depending on where the, the flowers, the, the plant is growing to go from flower to fruit. It is an evergreen tree, uh, like a lot of trees in the tropics, meaning it doesn't, it doesn't mean that it never loses leaves, um, but it doesn't go through a period of, uh, of dropping its leaves. Um, seasonally, like a deciduous tree would. Um, and because that, because it's always green on the plant, it's always growing, it's always producing. And so on the same plant, you can have flowers, you can have fruits, you can be harvesting one set of berries while the others are growing. Uh, a typical tree produces about one to one and a half pounds of finished coffee beans per year. So essentially when you're buying a, a pound of pound bag of coffee, um, you're bringing home about the entire harvest of a single tree. And then when we look at the anatomy of a coffee bean, there, it's very complex. Uh, this is a droop, so it's not a true berry, um, as, as, as we define in the pumpkin episode, essentially. So the middle part here is the true seed. Um, it's it called a seed, a nut, a pit. Um, we call it a bean, uh, and there's two beans per fruit. The botanical term for the coffee bean is the endosperm, and then outside of the bean, number three is kind of pointing to it, it's a little hard to see, something called the silver skin, which protects the seed and has a, a really cool name, the spermoderm, also known as the testa or the epidermis. The spermoderm protects the endosperm, 
and and starts this fantastic tongue twister. The endosperm is covered by the spermiderm, which is surrounded by the endocarp. The endocarp is also known as the hull or the parchment coat. And then another layer of protection is a very sweet one. It's a the pectin, uh, it's called a parencina, the very slimy honey-like layer, very sweet. Surround, that's surrounded by the mesocarp or the fruity pulp of the bean, which is then surrounded by the tough outer skin known as the pericarp or the exocarp. So if you ever get hold of a fresh coffee bean, um, these are all fancy words thrown out, but if but uh, if you can pick one off the tree, it's it's kind of fun to to kind of dissect it, take it apart, look at the layers, taste each layer. Um, and from the perspective of the wild coffee plant, that's what it wants you to do. It wants you to eat it, um, at least a mammal like us or, or some birds. And it, it wants us to eat it, so it makes it sweet. And um, then we eat it and either spit out the seed, which is very bitter, or we poop out the seed. Either way, the seed can go to a new place um, to, to grow into a new tree. And, um, but, but it really doesn't want us to eat the seed, right? It wants us to eat everything but the seed. It doesn't want us to destroy the seed because then it can't grow. So it has all these protective layers, but then it also loads the seed with the bitter chemicals. Um, and that's essentially a defensive adaptation of the plant. It's saying, please eat my delicious outer layers and disperse my seed, but don't eat my seed. I prefer that you'd spit it out. Um, and, uh, and so that's why it's, it's, it's loaded with chemicals. And then in fact, one of the most popular and expensive varieties of coffee you may have heard of, uh, comes from fruits that are swallowed by civets, which then poop out the beans, which when then we harvest and roast and drink, and some people swear by it and it's very expensive. And, uh, once, a, once or twice a year, as I mentioned earlier, I, I teach a tropical ecology course. And when you look at the plant-human interface, particularly with tropical plants that are really in this fight for survival, um, a lot of the plants produce defensive compounds that are toxic or noxious in the hope that we don't eat them because they want it, they want us, again, they want us to eat the parts they want us to eat, they'll make sweet. The parts they don't want us to eat, like the leaves or the seeds, they'll they'll fill with toxins. But it's just this ironic twist where humans are so stubborn and we're going to get around that and and then the things that the plant makes that wants us you know to not eat them or that it hopes makes us not want to eat them we humans have have uh you know gone around and turned into the things that we crave most um so things like coffee and tobacco and chocolate and and even tea uh those are loaded with defensive compounds like caffeine and nicotine and tannins, but if those are the chemicals that we end up craving in the end. Um, then the, from an evolutionary perspective though, I, I think the plants win in the end because even though it doesn't want us to eat them, we start harvesting and producing these plants particularly because of that. And then we end up planting them around the world. So from an evolutionary perspective, I think the plants end up winning in the end. So we have this tree that produces these sweet, sweet cherries with the noxious pits, um, just kind of an ordinary tree. But then over the millennia, humans have developed an intense attraction to this otherwise ordinary flowering, fruiting plant um, to the point where it reached its the immense popularity it enjoys today. Um, and, and so this is where the fun begins. The, the story, at least in current lore and legend, starts with a man by the name of Kaldi, uh, who was a goat herder in Ethiopia. And one day he brought his goats past a coffee tree and the goats naturally imbibed on those sweet, sweet berries of the coffee tree. And as one might expect, it didn't take long for the caffeine in the berries to have an effect on his goats. And pretty soon, to Kaldi's astonishment, the story goes, his goats got up and started dancing. Uh, and they danced nonstop without sleeping all night and all day long. And Kaldi was a little perplexed by this behavior in his goats and he needed to figure out what was going on. And so he too decided to eat some of the berries. And before you know it, 
Kaldi is also under the spell of the coffee, and he too begins to dance along with his goats. And now at this point, he's so excited about this new plant, this new berry that causes everyone to dance uh, and, and not sleep. And he feels he needs to spread the word of this amazing plant. So he brings some berries to a local monastery. And the monk tries some of the berries, but finds them way too bitter. And he calls them the food of the devil and then spits them out of his mouth, of course, right into the fire. Soon the aroma from the beans roasting in the fire begins to spread first through the room and then through the entire monastery. And soon the monks start to sing the best part of waking up and the rest is history. Um, so obviously we have no idea what the real story is. The story of Kaldi, which has been told for hundreds of years, um, after this, this happened after, you know, coffee was already very popular. It was told in, in the 1600s in, in Iran. There are likely elements of truth somewhere in the story, but, um, you know, there likely wasn't a actual Kaldi. However, uh, Kaldi and his dancing goats live on today, stamped all over the marketing of modern day roasters and cafes. The true story of how humans and coffee started interacting uh, is likely way more nuanced, being shaped over thousands of years. Um, what we think happened is that, again, if you were to go back, let's say we go back 1,500 years, and, and we're in the highlands of Ethiopia, and the people that live there, uh, this is the birthplace of coffee. It's also the birthplace of humanity. Um, and, and people are enjoying and using different parts of the forest, and one of those plants that they use is this coffee plant. And um, it's, you know, part of this, this rich and berry diet. Uh, if you look at the story of the cranberry in North America, uh, the people here were, were mixing the cranberry with bison meat and fat to make kind of a power bar. And in the highlands of Ethiopia, it was being used in a similar way uh, and is being used in a similar way. So the berries of the coffee tree were mixed with animal fat and other foods either crushed or as whole berries and ground, um, a, a, a good source of energy that could be transported over long distances. So kind of the original power bar. And people were using the coffee leaves for tea and they were making a drink and a tea out of the dried coffee fruit. But in all cases, as, as far as we know, the focus was on the berry, not the seed, like, like is, is common with many fruits. Um, in fact, the first kind of widespread use for coffee um, is, is, is the reason that coffee starts making its way into the trading routes of the world is for these fruits, um, not for the seeds. And so this, this again, this, this first widespread use of coffee is a drink called Kisha. Uh, and that's a tea that's made from the dried coffee berry. So dry the berry whole with the seed, um, thinking about the fruit itself, not the seed, but then the beans are making, you know, as they start trading uh, the berries, the, the seeds are going with it. And then one of the first, maybe the first major port that becomes part of the coffee trade is a place with a familiar name called Mocha in Yemen. And then, you know, from this point on, you, you have entire books written uh, about how coffee has shaped humanity, how humanity has shaped coffee. I found a, a fascinating six-part podcast. So there's just so much. It's, it cannot be uh, you know, underestimated how much coffee and humans have evolved together. Um, so then rather than kind of trying to drink from the fire hose of this information, I'm going to continue with the extremely cliff notes, extremely brief version here of coffee cultivation. So one of the one of the first groups of people that really started enjoying Kisha on a large scale are, were the Sufi people. And you know, I'm not a religious historian at all, but one of the things that you may associate with Sufis are the Sufi whirlers, uh, the whirling dervishes, people dancing for hours uh, through the night, um, twirling, arms outstretched. And this is part of their religious devotion but this is not a religious order. So 
these are people meeting to form devotions to God outside of their kind of everyday normal lives. And so this happens during the night. Um, you know, part of this is kind of achieving this transcendental state through dance, and it can go on for hours on end. And if you're doing this, having a beverage Kisha that gives you that energy for these long religious devotions, um, it, it becomes pretty popular. Uh, and then kind of go back to their, their quote unquote, normal working lives. Uh, we don't have Kisha today, but you can find something similar, uh, it, a, a tea made with dried coffee fruit. So the dried fruit of the coffee makes a tea uh, called cascara. And those who drink it find it very energizing, similar to like mate, uh, but, the, and, and you can also, mate is a leaf, but you can also find tea made with coffee leaves. It's a little confusing. So you have tea made from coffee leaves and coffee fruit. And these are things you can, you can uh, still enjoy today. So it's probably- We have a quick question. Oh, sure, of course. Um, is Keisha sweet? Say that again. Is Keisha sweet? I, I don't know how it was tra- Oh, I see. Yes. I'm yeah. I from what I understand, when you're steeping the the berries, there is a sweetness added to the tea. Whether or not people add sweeteners to that, I don't know. I've never had it. Um, but from what I understand, it does add a kind of sweetness to the to the water by steeping the fruit. So I think some of that sugar makes it out into the tea, but um, don't quote me on that. Um, so then you have, uh, so, I mean, you know, this is, if you really kind of want to enjoy coffee in a much more traditional way than we do today, uh, this is, this is how you could do that. Um, channeling humanity's early relationships with coffee. Um, so then you have, so you have this Keisha beverage spreading and, and it spreads then outside of the religious circles. And then uh, people start enjoying it for the energy it gives you. And then and then somewhere along the way, again, it's a long, complex history, people start focusing less and less on making beverages from the dried fruit, and they start focusing more and more on the seed. And then you get a beverage called bunk or kava. And um, as people focus more on the seed, they also begin roasting the seed. So again, however the first roasting happened, likely, you know, anytime you put something in a fire, it, it that toasting smell is often really good. Um, people start to roast the seeds more. So you focus less on the fruit, more on the seed, and then you also start roasting. And a little at first, more and more, by the time the beverage makes its way to Istanbul, to Turkey, where it becomes very popular, uh, you get really the birth of what we think of as coffee uh, in the form of Turkish coffee and known as the wine of Araby. It's, it's uh, really the original coffee in the way that we drink it today as a very, very dark roast. Um, and, and the people at the time and, and still today uh, like to adorn their very strong coffee with sweeteners like sugar they will add spices, spices that were found in, you know, those original spice trades like cardamom and, and chicory and coriander, the, the, the kind of staples. Um, and so you kind of have the birth of what we consider coffee today. It's becoming hugely popular as a beverage. And then we're, we're right around the year 1000 right now. Um, and so this depiction of, of people enjoying coffee in Turkey shows demonstrates another really interesting thing is that as coffee spreads it starts to become synonymous with two very important human processes uh, socializing and learning so you have things called kabekanes which are public coffee houses they become really popular as a gathering place at which one sips coffee and and pontificates and learns and talks and discusses um philosophizes they become known as schools of the wise uh where as as chuck bryant so eloquently puts it people sit around and learn stuff together so 600 years later in london 
600 years. Uh, there are more than 300 coffee shops or, or schools of the wise, um, which is saying something because we all know about Brits and their tea. Uh, and, and even in London, coffee and learning become synonymous as, as coffee shops become known as penny universities since the price of a cup of coffee was a penny. And again, it's this you're learning stuff while you're drinking coffee. And there's no doubt that this aspect of coffee, the socializing and learning, learning continues um, to permeate our culture to this day. If you want to catch up with someone, socialize, you, you know, I invariably say, let's go grab a cup of coffee. Um, when I need a place to study, bring my book or laptop to a coffee shop. Um, in Sweden, the word fika is, is an inversion of the word cafe and it's about the process of socializing over coffee. So coffee is enjoyed everywhere. Um, despite my best attempts to keep the coffee plant that John Bales gave me alive, he, he was very good at, at growing house coffee in his house. I was terrible at it, um, which demonstrates that co coffee can't grow everywhere. So it's enjoyed everywhere, but it can't grow everywhere. It can only grow in the tropics essentially in what's called the bean belt or the coffee belt. Um, so this is a good time to, to go back again to, to that early spreading of coffee. So by the time you have these very popular Turkish coffee houses, um, coffee is really only being produced for export, uh, not in Ethiopia, but in, in the Southern Arabian Peninsula, so it's essentially um, modern day Yemen. And this is how Arabica coffee got its name. Coffee is spreading so rapidly and becoming so popular that the people in Yemen understand what a moneymaker coffee can be and will be. Um, and this is, of course, the people in power, um, which, you know, this, this only kind of begins the, the dark side of, of coffee's human history of plantations and slavery and, and you know, the story you get with all the cash crops, you have, you have human greed uh, rearing its ugly head over and over. In Southern Arabia, dried coffee beans are exported, but it's strictly forbidden to export live coffee plants or viable coffee seeds, punishable by death. The people in charge want the monopoly to continue. They want to keep it. Um, and it's, again, hugely popular. But Despite their best efforts, this, this best, best kept treasure soon escapes. There's a lot of fun stories of, of espionage and, and trickery and, and, and coffee escaping um, to spread to all the areas where you think of today, where you buy coffee, Java, Brazil, Indonesia, Sumatra, Bali, uh, Colombia, Costa Rica, on and on. All of these are tropical areas. And particularly those that have mountains, because Arabica coffee grows best at about two to six thousand feet in altitude, because it can't handle extreme heat. So it needs the, the temperatures to stay somewhere between sixty and seventy-five degrees Fahrenheit. It can't get too hot. It definitely can't get frost, which is why we don't have coffee growing in Florida. Uh, it needs about sixty inches of rain a year, on average. So there is a definite coffee growing zone of conditions known as the bean belt um, that fortunately many places in the world can accommodate to, to supply the world with the extreme demand for coffee. Today, Brazil is, is uh, the leading producer of coffee at a position it's held for 150 years. Uh, they've got about 5 million people employed in the coffee uh, business harvesting about 3 billion coffee plants. So one out of every three cups of coffee in the world comes from Brazil. It's also important to note that coffee didn't immediately take off in Europe. It was a, a bit controversial as a, as a stimulant, as a bitter drug, and, and, and not only in Christian religions and others, it was, it was kind of associated with, with Satan and, uh, or the devil or evil, or however it's you know, manifest itself. But for the Catholics, it actually needed to be brought before Pope Clement the eighth to determine whether it would, whether pretty much the, the Pope had a lot of power in his hands to determine, well, are we going to accept this, this drink, drink of the devil, or, or are we going to 
forbid it. And history was written, was written when the Pope sipped some coffee, probably in front of a lot of nervous eyes, and declared, ah, that's, that's good. That's something I want to sip or something along these lines. I want to enjoy this. So uh, a lot of power resting on that moment. Imagine things would have changed quite a bit if he would have spit that coffee out all over his papal robes. Um, but I imagine even if he had done that, eventually coffee would have made its way in into all parts of the world. Um, there are so many stories of coffee influencing history. Uh, there are plenty of places to read them or listen to them. The largest insurance company in the world, Lloyd's of London, began in Lloyd's Coffee House. Um, the Boston Tea Party, which was planned in a coffee house, the, the Green Dragon. Uh, a lot of events led to coffee being the most popular drink on the planet after water. And it is the second leading commodity traded, second only to oil. And, um, you know, I mentioned at the beginning, there are two major species of coffee that are part of the industry. So Arabica has been the central character up until now. But then you also have a species called uh, Cafea canifora. And this is the one that gives us the Robusta variety of coffee. It's, it's a smaller, rounder bean. And uh, what's important for the industry is that Robusta is a much hardier tree than Arabica. It doesn't need that kind of narrow set of conditions. It can grow in much hotter environments, so in lowlands up to 85 degrees. And um, for many years, this variety was, you know, it was and is kind of looked down as the inferior a stepchild of, of coffee, coffee um, particular because it was the coffee that was associated with the coffee that America grew up on. The, the brands with the jingles that we all know from the, from the commercials, the fill it to the rim. And, and uh, that really was coffee in America. Coffee came out of a can. Uh, and, you know, that, that at least through most of the middle part of the 20th century. So, love them or hate them as a company, love or hate their coffee. It really was Starbucks. Most people agree that kind of introduced the uh, Arabica coffee to the US market, which had been dominated by this Robusta coffee. Uh, today, most of the coffee that you buy is a blend and, you know, depend unless you get, you know, single origin. So a lot of the breakfast blends, a lot of, a lot of the blends unless they say single origin are going to be a mix, not only of varieties, but of Arabic and Robusta because they each does add something to, to the flavor. So the, the Robusta is a little more bitter. It also has more um, coffee and, and adds more oomph. I mean, I'm caffeine, excuse me. Uh, and it, 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 it adds a little more body um, to, to the coffee. So, uh, and caffeine, something we need, and the other thing that um, I'm not really going to get into, partly because I'm not a healthcare provider, and you should not listen to me for health advice. Um, but you, you know, coffee—you always hear it's good for you, it's bad for you, it's it's got all of these benefits, um, or or can harm you. It it strips you, it de dehydrates you, it doesn't dehydrate you. It uh, you know. There have been a lot of studies that show a lot of different things with coffee. Um, I, I'm I'm going to continue to believe that it's healthy for me, and I think most studies say that it it is still healthy. Uh, you know, as long as you don't mix a ton of sugar into it, it can help with diabetes. It can um, help with with uh, your brain, and um, so you know, come to your own conclusion. Tea is also very very healthy. And so I try to try to drink a little bit of both, um, but uh, yeah, there's a there's a whole mountain of, of research on on the benefits or not benefits of coffee. Um, there's so many ways that coffee is prepared around the world: uh, different roasts, different combinations, different additives, different temperatures with milk, with yogurt, with sweeteners, with spices. And, and yes, only in Sweden do they pour hot coffee over chunks of cheese curds. Um, coffee tasters 
have identified more than 800 flavor characteristics within coffee varieties. So this isn't this isn't flavored coffee, which is kind of an abomination. I apologize if that causes any offense there. I personally think flavored coffee is um, more power to you if you like it. Uh, but we're not talking about flavored coffee. We're talking about like the flavor characteristics within coffee beans and coffee varieties, depending on where they're grown, whether it's volcanic soils or or um, older soils or uh, you know the the combination of temperature and and moisture and all of that stuff um, produces what more than 800 identified flavor characteristics by coffee tasters. That's about twice as much, uh, twice as many characteristics of flavor that wine tasters have identified. Um, so uh, just, you know, coffee isn't just coffee. It's, it's this huge industry, um, can be talked about forever. I'm one of the 80% of Americans who drink coffee regularly. Um, and so when I'm drinking my coffee and, and thinking of the history, I'm, I'm transported now back to three places. So first I'm taken to Turkey, the birthplace of coffee as, as we know it today, where it's made black as hell, strong as death, sweet as love. I'm also transported to Yemen, where coffee was first grown as a crop, and where according to historians, coffee production techniques haven't changed in 500 years. So if you go to some parts of Yemen today, you are seeing a way of life that is pretty much the same as it was uh, when coffee started to, to take off, um, you know, hundreds and hundreds of years ago. And then finally, I'm transported to the highlands of Ethiopia, to a cloud forest where coffee grows wild. It's not a flashy crop. It's not in your face. It's kind of hidden underneath the canopy. It's kind of hard to find. And when you do find it, you find just a very humble, ordinary tree making a living in the plant community, providing sustenance just the way many other plants do to birds, to people, and most importantly, to goats. So thank you for joining me today in my journey of coffee. I'm going to stop sharing my screen.